For the past four years, I've been using my trusty Ryzen 5 1600 processor from AMD for most of my gaming and editing tasks, but I felt like I needed a bit of an upgrade. So today, I'll be upgrading to the Ryzen 9 3900X. 6 cores versus 12 cores, 12 threads versus 24 threads, 14, 14 nanometer versus 7 nanometer. You're using an RX 580 though, right? Will it still be a bottleneck? Will it though? I don't know. Let's find out. Before we do that, of course, let's quickly go over what these processors actually are. The Ryzen 5 1600 was AMD's first attempt at actually competing with Intel at the mid-range market and was probably AMD's most successful processor for quite a while. The Ryzen 5 1600 boasted 6 cores and 12 threads on AMD's Zen architecture, and this processor aimed to compete with Intel's mid-range line, which had been often recommended for gaming purposes. This processor had decent gaming performance, but still had a ways to go, but it offered tremendous multi-threaded performance against its competitors, and thus found its place in the market. Fast forward a few years, we're now on AMD's Zen 2 architecture, where this architecture, Zen, was on 14 nanometer. Zen 2 moved to 7 nanometers, which allowed for greater efficiency within the same space. This process processor right here, the Ryzen 9 3900X, boasts 12 cores and 24 threads, so double the cores and double the threads as this processor, and it also features a higher base and boost clock versus this processor, while only consuming about 105 watts TDP versus 65 watts TDP. So AMD's packed a lot in this processor, but as I mentioned already, I'm still running an RX 580 from a few years ago, a mid-range $200 to $250 GPU. So am I actually going to see any gains with this? Well, that's what I made this video for. So going over the rest of the specs here, this box is heavy by the way, um, I ran both of those, these processors on the MSI B350 Gaming Plus motherboard. This motherboard is a 300 series motherboard, so it can't support anything greater than the Ryzen 3000 series. So I figured, you know what, let me try to upgrade my PC without touching any of my components except for the CPU. So I went with the 3900X. Other components include the Cryorig H7 cooler, which is being used to cool both of these processors throughout the test. Additional components include the graphics card, of course, which I mentioned, the Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 580, 8GB model. The RAM I used was the Oloy 32GB DDR4 at 3200MHz. It was two DIMMs at 16GB uh, each, so a total of 32GB. The boot drive I used was the ADATA SX8200 Pro PCIe Gen 3 SSD, so an NVMe SSD. And this SSD is a bit controversial because ADATA has been doing some quiet bait and switch of all of the components within this SSD. For your reference, this particular SSD that I used had the G variant of the uh, controller of the SSD. So uh, if that's of any interest to you, there you are. I was not able to determine the exact NAND flash uh, and DRAM cache used here, but uh, I was able to determine the controller. Anyways, that's there for your reference. All of these components were powered by a Seasonic M12 to 620 bronze power supply, a 620 watt fully modular power supply with an 80 plus bronze rating. And uh, all the components were housed in the NZXT S340 case. The testing methodology was pretty straightforward. I tested a couple of uh, synthetic benchmarks, but mostly games, and I ran each game or software benchmark uh, at least three times. I would often run it once to warm up the CPUs, and then I would run it three times and then take the averages that I obtained from each of those three runs, and that's the data I'll be presenting uh, in the graphs here today. We'll start off with the synthetic benchmarks. Looking at Cinebench R23, a CPU benchmark, we can see that the Ryzen 5 1600 has very respectable scores, but the Ryzen 9 3900X blows it out of the water, with 40% single core performance and almost three times the multi-core performance, despite it having only twice as many cores and threads. Moving on to validating the GPU with Unigen superposition, we can see that the performance between the two processors isn't very different, and this is to be expected in a very GPU-heavy benchmark like Unigen, so this comes as no surprise. But 
you'll quickly see that this tends to be the norm rather than the outlier. Moving on to our first game, Batman Arkham Knight came out a few years ago in an abysmal state initially, but is now certainly playable. The upgrade in processors showed little but noticeable improvements. At 1080p, there is an 11% uplift in the average frame rate and upwards of 25% increase in the 1% and 0.1% lows. Similar increases in the 1% and 0.1% lows were observed in the 1080p ultra-wide performance. The difference at 1440p though was negligible. Next up is control, and this graph sort of outlines the trend that we'll see in the rest of this video to be honest. There isn't much of a performance uplift between the two processors at all because I'm still so GPU bottlenecked by that RX 580. So regardless of how many cores and threads I can throw, there's not much the processor can do if there's still a GPU bottleneck. So there's those results for you there. Moving on to Days Gone, we see a similar performance. While there are minor uplifts in the 0.1% 1% lows across the three resolutions, the performance by and large is still very much the same at all three resolutions between both processors, so yeah, not much of an improvement there. Far Cry 5 shows similar performance differences, though there was a 5% performance improvement at 1080p. Additionally, at higher resolutions, the 0.1% lows saw an increase of 46% and 74% respectively. Like Control in Days Gone, Forza Horizon 3 shows very little improvement in the average frame rate despite the processor upgrade. GTA 5 is a game that actually saw the most noticeable upgrade in performance. At 1080p, there was a 13% increase in the average frame rate and a 57% increase in the 0.1% low, bringing the game to above 60fps at all times. Similar results were seen at 1080p ultra wide, again bringing the game to above 60fps at all times. 1440p results, however, remained relatively unaffected. Moving on to Hitman 2, and we're back to normal expected territory. The processor upgrade did nothing to alleviate the performance at any of these resolutions, and that's kind of the trend with the rest of the games here on this list. Horizon Zero Dawn, sort of a similar case. Yeah, we saw a little bit of increase in the 1% to 0.1% lows, but the average frame rates remained unchanged. Same thing with Immortals Phoenix Rising. A slight uplift in the 0.1% lows, but by and large the average frame rate was the same. Metro Exodus, same case not much performance difference between the two processors. Rocket League, yeah, same sort of scenario. A slight increase in the 0.1% low at 1080p ultra wide, but really nothing else notable here. The Division 2, same story. <laughs> not much else to really say here. The performance is identical between the two processors. The Rift Breaker CPU benchmark was where we saw some meaningful performance increase. The average frame rates at both 1080p and 1080p ultra wide increased by 12% thanks to the processor upgrade and a 7% increase was observed at 1440p. The 0.1% and 1% lows also saw increases across the board. The Rift Breaker's GPU test also saw performance gains with both 1080p and 1080p ultra wide showcasing 5% performance increases in the average frame rates. Perhaps the most dramatic increase in performance was seen in emulation. In PS2 emulation via PCSX2 and playing through the Sly 3 prologue, we saw a 32% increase in the average frame rate and even greater increases in those 1% and 0.1% lows. This is honestly what I do a lot of the time, so seeing these kinds of results is really exciting to me. The most dramatic increase in CPU performance was observed in PS3 emulation. Playing through a bit of the prologue of Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, we can see that these performance improvements are massive, with the average frame rates being twice as much with a processor upgrade. And those average or those 1% lows with the Ryzen 9 3900X match the average as seen with the Ryzen 5 1600. This is pretty cool, and for something that's still very much under development, as is with PCSX2, hopefully these performance gains continue to improve and increase. So PS2 and PS3 emulation is nice to see, especially with a $420 processor upgrade, but other than that, not very many games saw a performance uplift despite giving it twice as many cores and twice as many threads on a more efficient process node. So was this a waste? Well, maybe. The 
Problem is, I'm still very much GPU bottlenecked. An RX 580 is a very, very respectable graphics card, but in this day and age, it still can't keep up as much as it used to, which is always why you should buy for the now rather than for the future. Ironically, this is very much a do as I say, not as I do, because that's precisely why I bought the 3900X to begin with. Hopefully those 12 cores and 24 threads will come in handy someday, but for right now in terms of gaming, they just aren't. But I do want to investigate one more thing. AMD recently unveiled their Fidelity FX Super Resolution. If you're not sure what that is, it essentially downscales a game's frame and then upscales it while trying to maintain identical or near identical image quality with the end goal being that you'll get more performance. This can be viewed as a competitor to NVIDIA's technology Deep Learning Super Sampling or DLSS. Compared to AMD's FSR as it's called, DLSS operates at the hardware level while FSR operates at the software level. That essentially means that NVIDIA has dedicated hardware within their graphics cards to perform these operations whereas AMD is relying a lot more on software. But conversely, AMD's application is much more compatible with various levels of graphics cards, including NVIDIA's own graphics cards, while NVIDIA's deep learning super sampling technology is limited only to the 20 series and 30 series graphics cards. Regardless, AMD unveiled FSR recently, and a few developers have implemented it into their games already. One such game was the Rift Breaker, which I showed performance of very recently. And while FSR is still making its way into other games, and developers have pledged to include it in their upcoming games, FSR will really live or die by its uh, game compatibility and game incorporation. If it's not incorporated into many video games, it's really going to go to the wayside. But given the performance improvements that I'm about to show, I really hope it makes its way into more games because I think the performance uplift isn't anything to scoff at. Looking at the CPU test that the Rift Breaker includes, I have the previous results that I showed before, as well as the FSR results. Now, FSR lets you pick from, from presets that you can pick uh, depending on what kind of image quality you want. So the presets they have are ultra quality, quality, balanced, and performance, with performance and balance looking quite blurry in my eyes, and so I opted for ultra quality FSR here. And we can see some pretty decent performance upgrades. Looking at just the 1080p results for now, we already see a 10% improvement in the average frame rate just by enabling FSR with the Ryzen 5 1600. And with the Ryzen 9 3900X, we see a 15% improvement in the average frame rates, which is pretty cool to see for basically free performance. At 1080p ultra wide, we also saw some pretty promising performance improvements. A 15% performance increase was observed in the average frame rates when using the Ryzen 5 1600, and an 18% performance increase was seen with the 3900X. At 1440p, the results are even more promising. With the Ryzen 5 processor, average frame rates saw an 18% improvement going from 38 to 45, and with the Ryzen 9 3900X, we saw a 22% performance increase in the average frame rate. Really cool stuff, and again, FSR is basically free here. Moving on to the Rift Breaker's GPU test, we see some similar performance increases here as well. At 1080p, just enabling FSR gives us anywhere from 15-16% to 16 improvement in the average frame rate, and our 1% and 0.1% lows follow as well. At the 1080p ultra-wide results, our performance improvements are even more dramatic, ranging from 26-27% to 27 in those average frame rates. At 1440p, we don't see quite a big improvement in the average results, but our 0.1% and 1% lows definitely go up quite a bit to a very comfortable level above 60fps. And these results are actually quite impressive as those 1% 0.1% lows jump up anywhere from 21 to 30%. And remember, this image quality to my eyes was nearly identical to native resolution and it's basically free performance. So I'm really happy with FSR here, and I really hope it does make its way to more games, especially in this GPU shortage time. And with that said, that's about it for this video. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the work that I did here, feel free to leave me a like. Uh, if you have any questions about my testing methodology, or any suggestions, or just any general feedback or thoughts, definitely leave them in the comments down below, and I read every single one of them, and I try to reply to them, so definitely leave a comment if 
that's your thing. Um, feel free to subscribe if you are so inclined to do so. Uh, this channel is very random and sporadic and goes against everything that the YouTube algorithm recommends, but it's my channel. I kind of do what I like. Uh, so if you like this video and want to see more videos like this, uh, let me know in the comments down below and I'll definitely see what I can do. This kind of work is very entertaining for me and very enjoyable, but is very time consuming as well and <laughs> very expensive. Um, but you know, if there's an interest for this kind of very peculiar testing, let me know and uh, I'll see what I can do. As always, thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.